Good morning, friends. Facebook friends, put up your hands. Twitterites, welcome. Question for you. Does anybody know which famous artist painted this? Just shout out your answers, your ideas. Ben, yes, he's famous. My eight-year-old son, Ben, from Dr. Clark School in uh, Fort McMurray. Now, when Ben paints something, he does it regularly, I put it on Facebook, I share it. And a couple of months ago, I said to him, Ben, you know, it's a miracle that we can do that. And he said, a miracle, Papa, you're crazy. I said, no, it is a miracle. He said, why? And I said, well, you're eight. And when I was eight, does anybody remember 1975? <laughs> we didn't have internet. We didn't have computers. Well, they, we did, but they were the size of houses. And uh, we certainly didn't have scanners. So if my mother wanted to share something that I had done, not that I painted anything good back then, but if I had, she would have had to have pulled out one of these. This was our family camera from the time I was this small to the time I left ha the house in, in high school. So she would have had to have taken a picture. That was step one. But inside these things, for the young people in the audience, we had this, uh, film. Now, the thing about film was it came in rolls of 12, 24. You can see there's a 36 roll there. And if, and if you put the, if you, if the picture that you took was the beginning of the roll, well, there's no way you're going to pull out of the camera because we were cheap back then. We had to use every single frame. And so you'd have to wait for a birthday or two and a special event before you could ever pull it out of the camera. And then you had to take it to the local drugstore. Because I came from a small town, much like Fort McMurray was in 1975, and they didn't develop film here. You had to take it to the drugstore. They had to send it off. So that would be at least two or three more weeks. So by the time my mom had the inspiration to share something, in 1975, months would have passed. Today, Ben comes home from school. I say, wow. I scan it, and I put it on my Facebook in his album, and it is seen by 20, pardon me, 1,900 people around the world. So all of a sudden, there's this former colleague who's working at the Vatican. There's somebody in Nigeria. And oh, there's that guy that we met in Mexico who's responding to this wonderful piece of art. And I think that is an incredible miracle. Does anyone know this term, watershed moment? Watershed moments are those things that happen in history when everything changes. And, and a couple of examples for you. Um, the invention of the television. This is Ben, by the way, and I'm sorry for the gratuitous plug. But this, this play is all about the creation of the television. And the television absolutely changed our lives forever. So that was a watershed moment. Um, this thing, this is about from 1984, 85, the Apple II, the personal computer, well, it goes without saying it's impacted all of us. 9-11, it even impacted us here in Fort McMurray. I was scared stiff that day. It changed our lives. And then for me, this thing came along, Facebook. And I'm not saying it was a watershed moment for everybody, but for me it was. And it was April the 28th of 2007. I was in a meeting in Calgary of the Theatre Alberta Society. And I was in the room with, with actors, producers, directors. And in between each agenda item, all they could talk about was Facebook. They said it was screaming through the university campuses. And I said, well, that's pretty interesting. I went back to my hotel room, and I signed up right away. And the interesting thing is, up to that point, I had heard the term Facebook twice. But I didn't know what it meant or what it meant to me. But after that point, Everywhere I turned, it was Facebook. It had, reached, it had reached a tipping point. And when I went back to the beginning when they launched Facebook Timeline, right back to uh, April 28, 2007, there were two things that struck me. The first thing is, it's not that long ago. I went back and saw pictures of my kids from that time. Yeah, they're younger, but they're not that much younger, although it seems like such a long time ago. The second thing is, is the great fear of my generation about social media. And that's the thing about privacy and the great fear that, you know, that thing you did in Vegas? Someone took a picture of it and it's going to show up on Facebook. You ever feel that? Well, it happened to me. <laughs> so, be, being honest, in high school, I was an absolute nerd. I, I, I worked hard, I never went out, and I certainly didn't drink or get into trouble, except 1983, I went to a party and I said, okay, I'll have a beer. Someone took a picture and posted it. 
That's me, right in the middle. Look at the cool wristbands and the <laughs> white rugby pants. I was pretty cool, and I had hair. <laughs> but I got Facebook right away. Facebook is about connecting. It's, it's this idea that people want to belong, and they want to share. I got it. I reconnected with old friends, made a lot of new friends, and, um, and it was awesome. But the thing that was most interesting for me about Facebook was this idea about writing. You, some of you may know I write a blog called the Middle Age Bulge Blog, and it's one of my passions. But the roots of that blog go back to Facebook. And it goes back to a time when my son Dylan, who has mild cerebral palsy, had to go in for major leg surgery down in Edmonton. So this is 2008. Now, he was going to be away for quite a while, for four months, and I knew that the first couple of weeks were going to be really tough, and I was going to be spending all the time down there. And so I decided I wanted to share the experience with my family, because they were far away all across the country. And I, I thought, well, a great way to do that is to put it on Facebook Notes. And so I did, and I started writing the Dylan Surgery Adventures. And what was most interesting is that people around North America started reading these very personal stories and being moved by them. It was incredible, and it was a complete surprise to me. Dylan's Surgery Adventures number four. So you know what it's like. You have a surgery, uh, you come out of it, they got you on morphine and everything else, and you know, you're feeling pretty good, but then they start to wean you off the meds, and then when that happens, your appetite starts to come back, and when your appetite comes back, you start to eat. When you start to eat, eventually you have to go to the bathroom. But, you know, he'd had his, his femur severed, reattached, they rebuilt his foot, he had incisions everywhere, and so just to move hurt. So the time came when he had to go to the bathroom, and I was there, there was no nurse, and so I had to... I had to scoop him up and put him on a wheelchair commode. And then he did his business, and he's nine at this time, but he couldn't clean himself. I had to clean him. And then I scooped him up, and I put him back in the bed very carefully. And then he said, can I have a hug? And then he said, thank you for helping me today. And I wrote about it, and I captured that feeling in words. And it was incredible because people across North America chimed into the feeling, and we had this incredible connectivity. A horse of a different color, or in this case, a, a bird. <laughs> Twitter. I often hear from people that they don't get Twitter. I didn't either. I didn't. I, I was with it for about a year, and I really wasn't getting what possible use it had to me and the things I do at Keanu College or in the community. But I started to chime in on it when this guy died, Michael Jackson. I was on Twitter, and whoever was standing outside the place as the gurney was brought out tweeted, and I saw that Michael Jackson was likely dead right away. And it went from rumor to fact to the credible news agencies putting it out there. But the most interesting thing was that from the time I first saw it to the time I saw it on a website was about 40 to 45 minutes. Death at the speed of Twitter is what I call that. I started to realize this is, this is interesting. And then the Vancouver Olympics came along. Now, I'm not a sports guy at all, but I was into the curling in the Olympics. And, uh, you know, the men and women did really well. And they both ended up in the final. But on both those games, I was in Keanu Theater because Ben was performing in a play. And I was really conflicted <laughs> because I wanted, to watch, I wanted to watch the curling, but I discovered that all I had to do was pull this thing out carefully and search on Olympic curling. And the incredible thing was that thousands of people across the country were tweeting in real time. It was like I had my own play-by-play. -play. And so when the Canadian men won, I went, yes! And I looked around, and I wasn't the only one. There was about four people in the audience doing the same thing. That was a light bulb moment. But for me, the one that really defined what Twitter is all about is this event. 
May 15th, uh, a terrible fire was encircling the community of Slave Lake, as we all know. And I found out about it about 6.15 that night. I saw a post on Facebook. A, a colleague from a college down there said that uh, she's becoming increasingly disturbed by the images coming out of Slave Lake. So I go over to Twitter, and I see, oh, my God, this is, this is something pretty significant. As you probably remember, we were very dry at that time, and we had smoke in the air. So I was very concerned both from a municipal perspective and from a college perspective as to how would we respond if we were surrounded by fire. So I watched it very carefully and got engaged. I started tweeting at about 6.30, gathering information, pictures, video, verify, verification that there was, in fact, an evacuation. I was so exhausted by the time I went to bed at about 12.30, I just had nothing left, went to sleep, woke up, and wrote about it. And that blog post to date is the most, blog post, the most read blog post I've ever written. That's not the end of the interesting story with this, with this and uh, the role that social media played. That night, Twitter was a lifeline for those people. All they had was their mobile device. A Facebook group of the radio station in Slave Lake became the only place where people could go to find out if their house was still standing. It was incredible. I had a call the next day about 9 o'clock from the producer at CBC National News, asking me if I knew how to get a hold of the Slave Lake Mayor, because obviously I was so tapped in. I said, I said no, I have no idea, but thanks for asking. I've since told uh, Mayor Karina that story, and she was gracious enough, enough to allow me to use this uh, image for this presentation. The greatest lesson for me about social media is authenticity. Phil Cooper, that's your favorite word, and it really it resonates for the thing that we all long for with social media. It's kind of easy as an individual, harder if you're an institution or if you're a business. But this is the holy grail, in my view, of social media. And there's something, some ways we can sort of achieve that. Emerging events are awesome because they matter to all of us. And we've had many in our community, the terrible traffic jam. Do you remember that when the big gravel truck caused huge lineups and it was taking people three, four, five hours to get home from site and the poor guys are in their car and they had to pee but they couldn't pull over because they were still moving at a snail's pace. Well, what was interesting, I was home in my study and I completely got that event because of social media. Uh, another one, the, the Parsons Landing apartment fire. I was in Mexico waking up early in the morning in Malaki and I was able to follow what was happening back home with this terrible apartment fire. This is a more recent example. This is a NASA shot of nitrogen dioxide levels over a five-year period. And as you notice, it's barely a blip where the oil sands are, Edmonton, Calgary, pretty red. What you can't see is the eastern seaboard of the United States, which is a blotch of red. The most interesting thing about this image, I pulled it from a Globe and Mail story, but it went absolutely viral. 238 shares, 286 likes and 46 comments. There was something about this that really resonated with people. Social media is deeply personal. There was a colleague who was having a terrible day. He put his post on Facebook. He said, oh my God, my day sucks. I just want it to end. And I had just heard from this fellow's bosses the day before of how pleased they were with the work that he was doing. So I, instead of just ignoring it, I went and sent him a private note, and I said, sorry you're having a bad day, but I need you to know that your bosses have been saying some great things about you and that you are valued. You think that made a difference in his life, in his day? November, my dad was diagnosed with cancer, and I didn't say too much about it at the request of my mother, but I must have said enough because people started offering their prayers on Facebook. And I'll tell you, each and every one of those made a heck of a difference. Sometimes it's really simple. Sherry will remember this. I asked this the other day, what are you grateful for today? A simple question. But you know, instantly, within a half an hour, 21 people paused and thought about what they were grateful for. You think that brightened up their day? I guarantee it did. Sometimes it's good to laugh. So. I think the date was January the 19th. It was minus 40, and the kids were late getting out the door, and I'm stressed, and I get to work, and I need a coffee. So I run out of the Bob Lamb building over to the other building, and I get a coffee, and I'm coming back, and I'm walking down the hall, and I look down, and I go, oh, crap. <laughs> I got two different pairs of shoes on. 
I was so embarrassed because I was going to meet a minister in about an hour and a half. What was I going to do? So I pulled out my Blackberry and I took a picture. <laughs> says, if we can't laugh at ourselves, what's the point in living? I'm such a doofus. <laughs> and what's amazing about this is that I got 73 likes and 53 comments in an hour. <laughs> Nobody was working. <laughs> they were all on Facebook. At the end of the day, with social media, every voice matters. You know, I was taking a cab from City Hall to the Keanu uh, campus about a year ago. And the driver was from Libya. And we, I always like to, to engage the cabbies and find out their story. And, and I asked, well, how are things in your country? And he said, they're, they're, they're awful. And you know, they're never going to change. Two weeks later, they changed. And it was social media that made that possible. We all have seen this, I imagine. Three weeks ago, you would have had no idea what that meant. But today, parents are engaging in conversations with their children about things that are happening around the world. I think that's pretty special. Teresa Wells. A year ago, she was a mom. She decided she wanted to do something and make a difference. And she began the McMurray Musings blog. She's been at it for less than a year. The amount of readers that hear her story about us is astronomical. And she did that just as somebody that realized, I have the power to make a difference. Tito and Totsky. I know Totsky's here. They're doing it their way. They're telling our story. And they've used these incredible tools to do it in an innovative, smart, and funny way. So at the end of the day, I think Counselor Alan Vinney said it best. He said, the only mistake we can possibly make is to dream too small. Now, to be fair, Alan was talking about uh, urban development, but I think it applies perfectly to social media, don't you? I'm going to leave you with this thought. Focus not on your limitations, but on your opportunities. Think beyond the obvious and imagine the possible. Thank you very much.